Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. Patreon sponsored review time again. Although it's one that people have been asking me to review for a while now. Although there's a very good reason why I haven't honored those requests until someone paid me to do so. It doesn't suck. Seriously, people, I get asking me to review good comics on occasion, or even the Patreon-sponsored ones asking for the occasional good stuff, especially since around here we tend to focus on finding out on a weekly basis new ways of screwing up, but Blackest Night? Why this one? Admittedly, I at least have a little history with Black Lanterns. <laughs> That off-screen struggle was the stuff they write songs about. But anyway, yeah, even way back when it was just the first issue that had come out, people were asking me to review it. I mean, you might as well ask me to review any good crossover event comic. Note for 2017, Event Comic Month. Some flaws of the thing are the same ones that I can attribute to both Jeff Johns and event comics overall. Pointless deaths, massive amount of tie-ins that interrupt series, huge amounts of backstory, etc, etc. Although honestly, in this case, death is tied into the entire idea of the story. The tie-ins were actually so good that I bought almost every single one of them. And then all of the trades for them, because I'm kind of an idiot. And the backstory I was already familiar with. And you're all watching this instead of skipping to the theme song because you want the backstory too. And like comics are known to do, there's backstory, and then the backstory has backstory, and this is a review of eight longer than normal comics with a cast of hundreds. So this is probably going to be a bit of a long one. Hunker down, people. It's time for backstory! Hal Jordan, the Green Lantern, went insane after two supervillains utterly destroyed his hometown of Coast City. He tried to use his ring to recreate the city, but of course he couldn't, and the Guardians of the Universe, the tiny blue assholes who are supposedly the oldest race in existence and created the Green Lantern Corps to protect all sectors of the universe, penalized him for his selfish use of the Green Lantern ring. More pissed off and more crazy, he went on a killing spree, murdering the entire Green Lantern Corps and stealing their ring to give himself more and more power. He renamed himself Parallax and tried to reboot the universe because that's DC's go-to solution to fixing all their problems. Rebooting everything. He mostly failed, but sacrificed his life in order to save the Earth as a form of redemption. During another crossover event, Hal's soul was taken out of purgatory and merged with the Spectre so that he could try to act as an agent of redemption. However, the Spectre has this kind of overwhelming desire to kill and maim things in the name of vengeance which it did to a supervillain named Black Hand, turning his hand into coal. Black Hand was then retconned as being obsessed with death and murdering his family before committing suicide. More on that in a bit. Anyway, the Spectre seemed to be getting more and more out of Hal's control until it was revealed that Parallax was not what Hal became, but what had been influencing him for years. That the yellow impurity inside of the central lantern battery that gives Green Lanterns their weakness to yellow was actually an ancient creature embodying the emotion of fear itself. It had been infecting him because he was considered the greatest of all Green Lanterns and hated the Lanterns because of the imprisonment and because willpower and fear are apparent opposites. Ignoring, of course, that courage is the opposite of fear, like I've said before, and that in this color spectrum thing they keep saying green is the neutral one. Inconsistent mythology, or just overly complicated? You make the call! Anywho, with the help of Sinestro, former Greatest Green Lantern, dictator of his own people, and recurring Green Lantern supervillain, Parallax is set loose again and it is used to help create an entire Yellow Lantern Corps, referred to as the Sinestro Corps because Sinestro was also the most modest of Green Lanterns. During the Sinestro Corps War, one of the Guardians of the Universe got scarred, which made her go a bit nuts, but still remained with the other Guardians. Hal Jordan was resurrected and there there was much rejoicing. 
After the Sinestro Corps waged war with the Green Lanterns and the Heroes of Earth, because big crossover event, it was revealed that there was an entire spectrum of emotional colors, with their own representative entities similar to Parallax, like Ion for the Green Lanterns, or the Predator for the love-powered Star Sapphires. Love is represented by a being called the Predator. Ever get the impression that some creators have really weird ideas about romance? Although maybe it just embodies our love for awesome Schwarzenegger movies. One ugly motherfucker. Anywho, the end of the Sinestro Corps War teased that there would be a great war between all seven of the Corps. But what's more, that Black Lanterns, representing death, would come and bring about their final end with an event called Blackest Night. The Blackest Night itself comes from an old Alan Moore story, a prophecy about how the Green Lantern Corps would come to an end. An idea that Alan Moore himself described as desperate and humiliating, since they're trying to create a saga out of some random crap he made up for a short story. You know, like creating new stories based on ideas from other writers? Alan Moore wouldn't know anything about that. I kid, Alan Moore. If Stan Lee is the old grandpa of the comics industry who still wants to be cool, and Frank Miller is the racist grandpa who we invite to Christmas out of necessity, then Alan Moore is the really awesome grandpa with all the stories in him, but loves to rant about everything that irritates him. Although what's amusing is that people keep being shocked that he's pissed, when people keep asking him questions specifically designed to piss him off. To get back on topic, there are other little bits of backstory here and there that you don't need the full details for. That includes the resurrection of Barry Allen because of stupid reasons of iconic or something, despite most adult readers having grown up with Wally West, stuff like Identity Crisis and Infinite Crisis that I've talked about here and there, Batman was dead, except not really, from the events of yet another crossover event, Final Crisis. The most important thing, though, is that Black Hand has been chosen to be the representative of the Black Lanterns because of his retconned obsession with death. Because Jeff Johns has never met a backstory that he couldn't tweak to tell a story that was never originally intended to be a part of things. So let's dig into Blackest Night and see who lives, who dies, and who lives again. from a trade, and just the fact that there are eight friggin' issues and we have to get through them all quickly, so no looking at the covers. We're also going to ignore issue zero that was released on free comic book day, since it's really just set up for the event. We open at the grave of the Waynes, where Black Hand is hanging out. Some things are worse than death. Oh lord yes, Marvel, Bimbo's in Time, Holy Terror, all objectively worse. Black Hand is talking to the Skull because it's always been his lifelong dream to do Shakespeare in the park. My father said, everyone dies, William. My father's bedtime stories left something to be desired. He said, death is the only thing you can count on in this universe. Oh yeah? Then let's see death help me move a couch. I killed him to prove his point. Unfortunately, that did not make Thanksgiving any less awkward. I am hungry. Then my father got up and said, I'm dad, nice to meet you, hungry. Over in Space Sector 666, and while apparently the Black Lanterns really like their Christian symbolism, considering some translations offer the number of the beast as 616, maybe it's the Marvel Universe where we should be looking for true demonic activity, hmm? Food for thought? 
Anyway, in that space sector, trillions of black rings launch out of a giant black lantern to begin finding their bearers. And then Black Hand licks some slime off of Bruce Wayne's skull. Mmm. Grape jelly and mustard. Would not have called that. We cut over to Coast City a day later. Yeah, Coast City got rebuilt later without Hal's need to go insane, so that was a whoopsie. After Superman's death and resurrection, the day of his initial death against Doomsday instead became a national day of mourning for superheroes who have died, as well as those they were unable to save. I like this kind of thing. Not the innocence and superheroes dying, of course, but rather the world building. Part of the great thing about the DC Universe's long history was not only legacy characters, but just a world where superheroes have existed since the 1940s, and thus technology, society, and customs and culture end up adapting to to serve such a world. You kind of see a bit of that in the Marvel Cinematic Universe with repulsor tech and exhibits to people like Captain America at museums. The overall world is familiar enough to us in how closely it resembles us, but there's a bit of the fantastic there too. And since Coast City is the home of Hal Jordan, naturally all the Earth-based lanterns are part of the festivities there. There's some reflection on the people the various lanterns have lost, with, of course, our regular reminder of Kyle Rayner's girlfriend shoved into a fridge. Gail Simone saw that image and thought, maybe I should see how prevalent a problem this is. Jeff Johns saw that and said, cool, I should do that more often with characters. I kid Jeff Johns too, and this remembrance at least ends on a happier note with how Ice was resurrected. Which, hey, another point for the awesomeness of Gail Simone. We're shown a montage of others mourning the dead. Not just heroes, but villains too, like the Flash's rogues. And, of course, given the recent Blue Skying retrospective, the JLI mourning Ted Cord. Well, Goldie hasn't said anything about Blue Beetle. If you have something to say, Booster, you should say it. Okay, recently I traveled back in time to undo Ted's death, and it resulted in a lot of us dead, Maxwell Lord ruling the Earth, and the space-time continuum looking like a garbled VHS tape. So how are you doing? Aquaman had also died recently. Kinda, sorta. It's complicated. But he was buried on land due to his origin story, which we'll be getting to eventually. But Tempest, who you'll recall from the Titans retrospective, yeah, another nice thing about event comics, they tie together the whole universe so you see the full scope of things is saying that he should be laid to rest in Atlantis as its former king. However, of more pressing concern is that Alfred arrives at Bruce's grave to find it's been upended. Because apparently no one bothered to set up a friggin' security camera at the grave of friggin' Batman! Over at the Justice League headquarters, Hal and Barry Allen are examining a collection of dead bodies of supervillains that they have stored there. It might seem like kind of an asshole or just plain sick thing to do, but it's actually something recent they did. Over in Nightwing's solo series, there was a body snatching ring harvesting dead superhuman parts to be surgically attached to others to get superpowers. Yeah, I just don't get why they don't try to market superhero comics to kids anymore. Barry wants to know who else has died since he died, and we get a two-page spread of a freaking lot of superheroes, sadly. Hell, there are probably more that aren't even featured here. We cut over to a museum, where Hawkman is on the phone with our old great disaster-stopping pal, Ray Palmer. Ray wants to visit the grave of Jean Loring. Yeah, she's dead now, too. But, of course, it's kind of an emotional thing for him, and he would prefer to have his good, trusted friend Hawkman at his side. Hawkman tells him, up yours, and when Ray says he's going to come through the phone to talk to him face-to-face, -face, Hawkman smashes the phone. Lighten up a little, will you? My god, you're positively grim. After some character stuff between him and Hawkgirl, we head back to Barry and Hal, discussing the events of Identity Crisis before they're contacted by Alfred. And then cut over to the Guardians of the Universe. Yeah, the downside of a story with that huge scope is that we're all over the place, seeing all these disparate parts of the universe dealing with stuff and feeling chaotic. It all eventually comes together, mind you, but the narrative can feel a bit disjointed and unfocused. Anyway, the Guardians of the Universe. We have failed. For those unfamiliar with the DC Universe, that's actually their catchphrase. No, but seriously, the Guardians are a bunch of pompous, self-righteous, holier-than-thou little smurfs that have always thought they knew better than everyone else, 
And every single time, they end up getting proven wrong, and they learn nothing. When in another Green Lantern event, they decided to just wipe free will out of the universe and truly became villains, it was really a, oh, what took you guys so long kind of moment. Anyway, all of the various Lantern Corps are fighting one another, and they sense the approach of the Black Lantern Rings. So they realize they need to try uniting everybody against them. But Scar, the Guardian I mentioned before, who has been infected by the Black Lanterns, makes her move and bites into one of them for his creamy filling. And then she rips out the Guardian's heart. This is a weird remake of Jason Goes to Hell. The Black Lantern Rings head down into the tombs of fallen Green Lanterns. The Crypts of the Green Lantern Corps. Moro of Sector 666. Crypt Keeper. <laughs> The Guardian's heart that Scar ripped out evaporates to her irritation. You abandoned emotions eons ago. Your hearts are useless. Damn you and your lemonade. And all across the universe, we see the Black Rings take their hosts, which is both horrifying and creepy. Aside from Scar vomiting up black taffy on the other Guardians. Ew. But yes, here's your pants-crapping moment as we see the Black Lantern Corps rise, including Martian Manhunter. Yeah, he died in Final Crisis as well. See, this is the real problem with reviewing a book like this. You need a checklist to see which characters are dead or not. Hawkgirl and Hawkman are murdered by Black Lantern Sue and Ralph Dibney, and we see things from the perspective of the Black Lanterns, that living beings emit emotional colors off of them. And once they're killed, their hearts are extracted and absorbed into the Black Power Battery, a single life raising it by 0.01%. Part 1 ends with Black Rings going to turn the deceased Hawkman and Hawkgirl into new Black Lanterns. When you get right down to it, Black Lanterns are a new twist on zombie lore, to the point where some call the Black Lanterns the equivalent of Marvel's, well, Marvel zombies. It is a very similar idea in that since they're talking, it strips otherwise good heroic figures of their morality while still being able to use all the memories of the person they were. What makes it different, though, as it'll be explained later in the mini, is that the Black Lanterns are not corpses wearing rings. The rings are wearing the corpses. They're just puppets, calling on memories to force an emotional reaction out of their opponents. And at the height of their emotional reaction, the Black Lantern rips out their heart, and then the victim becomes a Black Lantern too. It's always one of the big fears about zombies in any medium. The fact that their numbers can swell so rapidly by making you one of them. It's like Comcast. Issue 2 picks things up from these various threads, Ray Palmer calling Hawkman again and getting the Black Lantern on the other end as he talks about how hard he's been thinking about Gene and how hard it is for him to let go. Well, I know one way of getting over psychopathic ex-wives is to flee to another dimension and hang out with an alternate version of her. Things don't go any better for some of the other characters we've seen, like Hal getting smashed into the bat signal, and Black Lantern Aquaman confronting Mera, Tempest, and a bunch of Atlanteans. Oh, and then Black Lantern Aquagirl, killed in Crisis on Infinite Earths, and Black Lantern Dolphin, a.k.a. Garth's wife, whom you may recall from the Titans retrospective as flip-flopping all the time over her feelings on the Titan stuff. Yeah, apparently her and his son were killed off-panel during the events of Infinite Crisis. Which means that three out of five of the original Teen Titans have had dead children. And considering the new 52 retconned out Wally and his kids, one could argue that four of them do! What the hell, DC?! Also, zombie sharks. Don't mess with Aquaman. Sadly, Tempest is killed by Aquagirl, but while it sucks to have yet another character that I liked killed, I can't help but be amused by the fact that since he doesn't have a last name, the Black Lantern calls him Garth of Earth. I don't, I don't really have too, too much to say right now. <laughs> What's that? Mera runs like hell while a bunch of sorceress characters, including the Spectre, the Phantom Stranger, Zatanna, and the Blue Devil, examine the Grave of Dead Man, a ghost character in the DC Universe who tends to possess others. He, too, was reborn as a Black Lantern. Unfortunately, the Black Rings quickly find their way to them and nab onto Crispus Allen, the current host of the Spectre, and through him turn the Spectre into a Black Lantern. 
And since, you know, he's literally the wrath of God, that's kind of a bad thing. Of course, we never see him again in the main series. Sir, not appearing in this film. Deceased Teen Titans Hawk and Dove are targeted by the rings, but strangely, every attempt by one to grab onto Don Hall, Dove fails, saying that he's at peace. Turns out the way to stop the Black Lanterns is to be, like, totally mellow, man. Hal and Barry manage to defeat the Martian Manhunter by creating a cyclone of fire around him, but issue two ends with him emerging from what's left of the fire alongside Black Lantern's Hawkman, Hawkgirl, Firestorm, and the aforementioned Sue and Ralph Dibney. Kind of a dark, twisted parody of the satellite era of the Justice League. In issue three, despite the last comic having us only at 3.43 power in the last update, we suddenly jump to 50.32%. I mean, I know the tie-in stuff was happening at this point, but I didn't think 5,000 people died in them. But yeah, the tie-ins. I'm not getting into them specifically with this review because, well, one, there are so many of them, and two, I'm willing to stretch the Patreon-sponsored stuff to cover an entire storyline like this, but there were like 40 tie-ins, and I just did an entire month of looking at hundreds of comics. Just no. Anyway, Barry tries to remove a black ring, but it's revealed that the thing has tendrils into the corpse that just reassemble it back in. They can't forcibly remove the rings. Ray Palmer then grows and explains that when he came in on the other end of the phone line, he shrunk down to get a better look at the black rings. There's some kind of porous structure that's channeling energy through microscopic wormholes, thus how they're growing in power by leeching off of emotional energy. Although Ray is not exactly in great shape himself. Why did these things go after Carter and Kendra first? My best friend is dead, Hal, and I don't think he's coming back this time. Spoilers! One of the things that does piss me off about this event is that, in fact, Hawkman and Hawkgirl do come back to life. But a whole bunch of others killed in this, like Tempest, do not. I'll get into this more a bit later, but screw you and your false pathos. The current Firestorm, who's a mixture of two characters named Jason Rush and Jehenna, arrive at the JLA headquarters in response to a distress call sent by Mara. She's figured out that the Black Lanterns weren't able to pursue her when she kept her emotions suppressed and bottled up, and now needs help. Back over to the battle, the Black Lanterns prey on Ray Palmer's compassion for Gene Loring and try to use that to get to his heart but they are saved by the arrival of the Indigo Lanterns. The Indigo tribe is... complicated. They're basically the Purple Lanterns, who wield compassion, except I'm not entirely convinced the writers understand what compassion is, because the Indigo tribe has this tendency to, well, do evil things dispassionately and brainwash people into becoming members of the Indigo tribe. It's less compassion and more forced penance. They also swear off individuality for the most part. Because truly, there is nothing more compassionate than making people do what you tell them to. And compassion has nothing at all to do with a person's individual thoughts and beliefs. They're interesting ideas, to say the least. It's just that the implementation in this regard seems... iffy. Fortunately, though, one of their abilities is to channel other emotional energy. As such, utilizing a combination of their own energy plus a Green Lantern's willpower, they're able to disable Black Lantern rings, severing their connection with a host body. They're still outnumbered, though, so the Indigo Lanterns teleport our heroes to Mera and Firestorm, where their leader, Indigo One, explains what the hell is going on in a two-page spread that I have to turn on its side. Yeah, unfortunately, Blackest Night has a lot of those, although I'm a little more forgiving in this case because they try to make it artistically interesting, as opposed to Liefeld, who would just have a guy stand in front of a blank wall. Indigo One's exposition dump is that when the universe began, there was only darkness. And the darkness was actually conscious to a degree. Not alive as we know it, but aware. And thus when light came to be in the universe, it got kind of pissed about the high beams and fought back, splintering the light into the spectrum we have now. Green, blue, violet, indigo, yellow, orange, and red. 
Every sentient being born from the light now contributes to its emotional spectrum. Our state of being adds to its respective light, and it can be collected and condensed into power. <laughs> no, 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 you've got it all wrong, Indigo One. Light is a finite resource in an emotional well that will eventually get extinguished, and the universe dies because gravity is just subatomic particles feeling love for one another. Thanks again for that info, Relic! The darkness is now fighting back again in the form of the Black Lanterns. They've attacked Earth specifically because the heroes of the DC Universe kind of have this tendency to save everything over and over. And the Black Lanterns are not the invaders in this war. We are the invaders. We are the trespassers. But we bring goodness. We bring life. So instead of Blackest Night, we should have called this, Turns out I'm the asshole. So their plan to win this through is that they need to combine all seven lights together to recreate the original white light. After some character stuff between Hal and Barry that isn't really relevant right now, the other Black Lanterns track them down and attack, with the Indigo Lanterns teleporting themselves and Hal away, leaving our other heroes on their own. Truly, their compassion knows no bounds. And unfortunately, this results in Jason Rush and Jehenna being separated, with the Black Lantern Firestorm absorbing Jason and gratuitously murdering Jehenna while he's forced to watch. Another character who doesn't get brought back to life, but Maxwell Lord does. Speaking of, Black Rings soon go towards all the dead bodies of the supervillains, waking them up, including Maxwell Lord who has a rope around his neck for some reason. Um, Wonder Woman had her lasso of truth around him when he died, but not around his neck. She didn't even use the rope to snap his neck. She used her bare hands and twisted his head around like a bottle cap. The hell is this random piece of rope? Did they put that around him later for effect? Or was this gonna be the worst practical joke ever come April Fool's Day? Issue 4 and another jump, from 56.58% to 93.55. So that's almost another 4,000 dead right there. All in all, today's been a bit of a bummer, hasn't it, sir? The Atom manages to expand his size-changing field enough to get Barry and Mara out of there, transporting them through a phone line to a 911 office. Meanwhile, the Scarecrow is walking around Gotham, seeing everyone fleeing in terror from a Black Lantern Azrael. He's a story for another day, too. But when Azrael comes up to him, there's nothing. Scarecrow exposits to himself that he used his fear gas one too many times and now feels nothing. As such, Azrael just walks right past him without sensing any emotions. We also get a cutaway to Lex Luthor, who's barricading himself behind layer after layer of underground bunker since he realized, oh crap, how many people have I killed over the years? They're gonna be pissed. Barry quickly takes charge of the 911 office, since of course they're getting calls by the truckload and he tries to keep everyone calm including Mara and Ray, who finally have a moment to realize how crappy things have gotten. He gives them the big speech, and the three separate again, with Mara and Ray heading off to join the Justice Society in battle, while the Flash sends out a message to all superheroes to explain everything, what the Black Lanterns are, what they can do, and how to fight them. Including, in particular, that even if you don't have a Green Lantern, light still seems to hurt them. Hello, Home Depot? I need every flashlight you have! The JSA do their best to hold them back, especially since they have Alan Scott's Green Lantern Ring, though it's only a temporary measure without another Lantern Corps ring. Damage, who you might also recall from the Titans retrospective, has been through a lot since those days and is naturally feeling a bit distressed about all this. But fortunately, Ray Palmer manages to inspire hope in him. Right on time for Black Lantern Gene Loring to rip out Damage's heart and get the Black Lantern battery up to 100%. Just in case you thought it was the New 52 that actually made you try to abandon hope and things, no, 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 no. They were doing this beforehand. With the power at its maximum, the Black Lantern battery transports itself to Earth and lands right in the middle of Coast City, with the Black Lantern chant of, Flesh! Flesh! This brings up the biggest question of this entire event. Why are they calling out for flesh? Despite my earlier comparison, they are not zombies. They are not trying to eat people. Their goals have absolutely nothing to do with the flesh of the living. Why not have them shout for hearts or something? Heart. Okay, fair enough. 
Black Hand summons forth the actual being responsible for this, Necron. Necron was an occasionally appearing Green Lantern villain, the Lord of the Unliving, an embodiment of death and master of an other dimensional realm between heaven and hell. Kind of like purgatory. Although, since this is the DC Universe where all religions are right, purgatory also exists and Necron isn't the only embodiment of death. This might seem confusing, and it is, but I can explain. Bear in mind that death as a metaphysical concept means many things to many people. As tragedy, as a horror, as a release, as an old friend. And as such, death takes on different embodiments of those concepts. For example, the Black Racer, who is a dude who rides on skis, because death also has a silly side, is the embodiment of death as an inevitability, since it will chase you forever. The Vertigo version of death from the Sandman, who also happens to kind of sort of exist in the DC universe as well, is the merciful embodiment of death. You've got archangels of death, gods of death, and then there's Necron, death as your opponent. The dude who you would play in a chess match if he offered you the chance. Although in this case, he does not. And I've gotta say, his design here is kinda meh. I much prefer how he first looked. Big white skeleton dude without a stomach and a giraffe neck. Almost completely skeletal. Here, he looks like he's shredded because he's been lifting his scythe, bro. This leads us into issue five, where we see that in the Green Lantern tie-in books, Hal Jordan has assembled representatives from each Lantern Corps, plus two Guardians of the Universe who have been handling the Blue Lanterns. Like the rest of the self-appointed Guardians, Ganthet and Sade were born on the planet Maltus, the world where life first began. Rent was cheap and beer was always on tap. That gave them the validation to act as the ultimate authority figures on intergalactic order. Operating on the ancient legal principle of I was here first. That doesn't mean they've handled it all that well. The management has apologized for the inconvenience and will be handing over coupons to all attendees. Necron wasn't the only thing to rise, since the Lantern saw fit to resurrect pretty much everyone who died from Coast City's initial destruction. Barry goes to take on Necron head-on. Your death was the first, Barry Allen of Earth, and your rebirth the last. Yeah, let me just unpack this a bit early. Necron claims that all the superhero deaths and resurrections since Barry Allen were planned by him. This is in spite of the fact that Jeff Johns already gave an explanation about superhero death and resurrection and tying it to Titan's supervillain Brother Blood. So Jeff Johns is now retconning his own retcons. And the purpose of the resurrections? Not a friggin' clue. Necron claims it's to help expose the Guardian's greatest lie, but said reveal doesn't involve them in any way whatsoever. So not only is it a retcon to a retcon, it's a pointless retcon to a retcon. Anyway, Wally West, the Flash, and this is why I'm referring to them by their real names, otherwise there'd be two Flashes, at least three or four Green Lanterns, and so forth, arrives to help along with all of Earth's superheroes. Dawn Granger, aka the second Dove of Hawk and Dove, is somehow channeling the White Light, so any attempts by the Black Lanterns to hit her results in them going poof. Much like the former deceased Dove not coming back to life, this makes no sense. Hawk and Dove's powers come from a Lord of Chaos and a Lord of Order to maintain a balance between the two opposing ideologies. It has nothing at all to do with Light or the Green Lanterns. In other words, it's magic! And you do have to explain it! Hal arrives with the gathered lanterns, and they blow Scar up, but good. They then try uniting their energies on the Black Lantern battery, but it doesn't do anything. Sure, they're uniting all seven colors, but it's the difference between a candle and a sun. They just don't have the raw power necessary to destroy it. It's here where we get the whole retcon bit, as Necron temporarily resurrects Bruce Wayne as a Black Lantern to create an emotional tether to all those who see him, allowing him to convert all the superheroes who have died before, including Superman and Wonder Woman, into Black Lanterns, leading us into issue six. Barry and Hal are also targeted by Black Rings, but Barry manages to run so fast that he time travels two seconds into the future. Of course! Don't you know anything about science? Which severs their connections to them. Unfortunately, that's only a temporary victory, since we soon learn that 
well, every Black Lantern in the universe is converging on Earth. Which, as you can see from this two-page spread that I need to turn on its side, is several billion Black Lanterns. I would say pants to be darkened, but I think at this point its entire wardrobe's darkening. So, obviously, they need a new plan. Ganthet says that they need to unite all the Lantern Corps together, which Indigo One says her tribe can do, but it'll take time. To buy them some more time, they need more Lanterns now just to hold off the hordes they're already dealing with. As such, Ganthet activates a protocol inside of Hal's Ring that allows it to deputize someone into the Green Lantern Corps for 24 hours, becoming a Green Lantern himself. The other lantern rings, while being unique colors, are all based on the same technology, which means their rings have the same protocols. The rings quickly picking out six other individuals to join their respective cores. Barry Allen becomes a blue lantern of hope, Scarecrow, a yellow lantern of fear, Ray Palmer, an indigo lantern of compassion, Mara, a red lantern of rage, Wonder Woman, a star sapphire of love, healing her from the black ring, and Lex Luthor as an Orange Lantern of Avarice. Ray Palmer is a bit of a stretch, and Mara's rage seems like something they needed since she really hasn't been that angry so far in the story. But kudos on the other choices, frankly. Barry had been the one going around inspiring people and getting them to rise up. Scarecrow is obvious. Wonder Woman loves every living being in the universe. Which is why she snapped Maxwell Lord's neck like a Slim Jim. I kid, of course. Wendy is always the person who will try to end a fight by extending a hand of friendship. If you've surfed around enough comic circles, you've probably seen that scan of Wonder Woman saying that she doesn't have a rogues gallery like Superman or Batman because she ends threats. Which, of course, I'm sure was meant to be lol, murder, death, kill. But in reality, it's because she's the one who ends threats by making friends with them. Oh sure, it's already inaccurate because she does have recurring supervillains, but she's also the selfless one who will injure herself to make an ally if she can. Hell, that's something that goes all the way back to the Golden Age. People fixate on the bondage stuff, but nobody actually focuses on the message, that the lasso of truth is about showing someone the truth about themselves, and she'll be there to help them recover and change their ways. Batman and Superman do that too, but to a lesser extent than her. She's an ambassador of peace, not just between warring nations, but between people, trying to solve their problems and grant them true peace to themselves. But oh yeah, the other brilliant lantern casting of Lex Luthor as an orange lantern, powered by utter greed and want. And the greed is not about money, but just wanting more and more for himself. Power, adoration, etc. But of course, we all know he's not that greedy. After all, he loves to share his piss with people. We enter issue 7, where the deputized lanterns join in on a direct attack on Necron, and it does nothing. I'm used to being overlooked, but Necron's not giving any of us a second glance. I even yelled out, I'm Ray Palmer, welcome to pain, and still nothing! Because Necron's nothing like the evil we eradicate day to day, Adam. He's not going to launch into a lecture and make this personal. Really? Because he was just doing that to the Guardians of the Universe before you attacked him. The rest of the Lantern Corps soon arrive to deal with the billions of Black Lanterns headed for Earth. Down on the ground, Necron murders one of the Guardians, and Black Hand rips out all of his internal organs, which are all multicolored like the Lantern colors. It's very much unnecessarily gory, another thing Jeff Johns loves, although it's more appropriate here than it was in Infinite Crisis, given the whole undead horror thing. And according to the behind the scenes in the trade, the reason that the organs are like this is because the Guardians internalized the seven emotions, or some crap like that. But doing this somehow allows him to summon up a white creature, referred to as the Entity. No, not anything missing or the like. It's the guardian creature for the white light of life. As I talked about at the beginning, the emotional spectrum has creatures representing their individual light. In this case, a big white soft-faced thing that looks like we're disturbing its nap. Necron attacks it, and since it's connected with all living things, everything alive is injured by the attack. Ganthet reveals the truth. The Guardians of the Universe are not the first life forms in the universe. Life in the universe began on Earth, with this entity. They distorted the truth to protect it. The entity won't fight without a host, so Hal flies into it to try to become the White Lantern, 
only to be stopped by Sinestro, who says this is his duty. I am the greatest Green Lantern of them all! But in purple, I am stunning! And thus we come to the final issue, where Sinestro rips out Necron's heart, destroying him. Well now, that wasn't so difficult. I know, right? More event comics should end with just ripping out the heart of the big bad. Seems like an easier way of getting stuff done. But of course, it's not the end. Necron is death. I mean, it's not like he can just physically harm death. Not today, matey. <laughs> well, technically that didn't kill death, so it doesn't count. Anywho, unfortunately, yeah, they can't really kill Necron, and Sinestro is already losing control over the entity. It's just too powerful. The rest of the Lanterns descend from orbit to help, but it's still not enough. Dead Man possesses Guy Gardner, he's been appearing here and there in a small capacity, gathering information about the Black Lanterns, and he's figured out the key to this. Necron has created a tether to the Land of the Living through Black Hand. If they can find a way to bring Black Hand back to life, the connection will be severed, and Necron will be forced back into the Land of the Dead. Necron, who of course does not give lectures or make things personal, Lectures, how he totally allowed others to come back to life, and that he wants the personal piece of everything being dead again. There's some pontificating by Hal Jordan and Barry Allen about how Necron didn't do squat. Everyone came back to life because, in the end, we give life purpose and will always choose life before death. Unless you're comic creators. Hal flies into the Entity and, since everyone is connected by life, makes the formerly dead superheroes into White Lanterns, using their combined might to resurrect Black Hand. The Black Lantern battery is shattered and Necron goes and blows himself up. In return, a bunch of White Lantern rings fly out and resurrect a bunch of people. Osiris, Aquaman, Martian Manhunter, Ronnie Raymond, aka Firestorm, Captain Boomerang, Professor Zoom, Hawkman, Hawk Girl, Hawk, Jade, Maxwell Lord, and Dead Man. This is the thing that actually really pisses me off about this book. They had an opportunity here for a fresh start. Resurrect everybody, all the dead superheroes and supervillains. Great storytelling opportunity, and give things a clean slate, and thematically connect with that image earlier of all the dead heroes and ending things optimistically. Or, you know, we could just do this as set up for one disappointing bi-weekly series, and another one that was actually pretty good, before it's all rebooted anyway in the new 52. That works too! So after a few bits of shenanigans to set up for other storylines in the Green Lantern books, Blackest Night ends with Hal and Barry talking about how dead is dead for real Z's this time, no take backs, and Batman is probably alive so we should probably work on finding him over in his own little event thing. Because why would we want to recover from a major event before we head into another one, right? Despite my snark and criticisms, Blackest Night is actually pretty damn good. It is by no means perfect, but it did what it set out to do. Tell an entertaining story with large stakes and hopefully some impact both for character development and for potentially new stories in the future. The contradictions and lack of fulfilled ideas in some areas are frustrating, but not enough to ruin the overall enjoyment of reading it. The tie-ins serve to enhance the story, and while stuff like Hal finding the other Lantern Corps members to join his group probably should have been a part of the main narrative, its absence does not hurt the story too much. One flaw in regards to the scope of things is that while the first issue explored various aspects of the DCU and how they would be touched upon by the Black Lantern invasion, we don't really see how this was a universal problem in the main series, which pretty much kept the action 99% of the time to Earth. And considering the story stuff related to the Entity, I suppose that makes sense, but since this was the storyline that Jeff Johns had been building up to for several years, you'd think that in the main miniseries we'd see just how big an issue this was and not just relegate that to the tie-ins. The artwork is fantastic, going for a very dark atmosphere where it needs to, and a bright, awesome atmosphere to reflect when things are turning in favor of our heroes. The Black Lanterns are simultaneously repulsive and horrific, and as a horror fan, I can say they were definitely as scary as they were meant to be. Blackest Night is ultimately a big-budget popcorn flick. Really damn entertaining, you'd probably enjoy seeing it again, but don't try to think too hard about it. Next time, we head over to Early Image again, because we can never get enough of that dead horse coming back to life.
first line of the comic is overwritten nonsense. The motivation of the Black Lanterns is that life is a corruption of the natural state of existence, aka non-existence. So how is death a worse thing in any capacity? 